This reading is from Galatians 5, 22 to 25. It's page 1816, 1816. It's very short, so I may be done before you find it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for its power. Thank you for what it teaches us. And I pray, Lord, as we look into your word, that you would use these weak words, Lord, to, to honor and glorify you, to speak to us where we are, to teach us something about who you are and how you want us to live. We welcome your spirit into this place, Lord, and ask that you would teach us and then this week remind us of all the things we've learned. Lord, please give me the strength to do this. Take this time, it's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we continue our study on the Apostles' Creed this morning by looking at the line, I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Apostles' Creed is a statement that was formulated in the early church to put in kind of a summary form all of the basic beliefs of Orthodox Christianity. And among these basic beliefs of the early church was a belief in the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, in the church of the 20th and 21st centuries, the Holy Spirit and teaching on the Holy Spirit seems to have been relegated to, to certain denominations and certain religious rev and revival movements. But I, I think that's changing today. And today, among millennials and younger generations in the church, we have seen um, a move and, a, and an opening about teaching about the work of the Holy Spirit. I believe that a balanced biblical view of the Holy Spirit and his work in the world and in the life of us as Christian believers and in the church in general is essential for us to grow in spiritual maturity and in our effectiveness in impacting the world around us for Jesus. It's only through the work of the Spirit that we can grow to become more like Jesus, to live the kind of life that God created us to live. It's only through the work of the Spirit in our lives that we can truly make a difference in our sphere of influence, make a difference in that small part of the world where God has placed us, make a difference for Jesus in the lives of other people. Now, as I was preparing this talk this week, I thought that I would kind of give an overview from Scripture about who the Holy Spirit is and, and what the Holy Spirit's role is in our lives as Christians. But as I look back over some other sermons that I've preached recently, I realized that I'd already preached that back on Pentecost Sunday, back in May, on that very topic. I preached a rather long sermon that gave a broad overview about the work of the Spirit. And so I thought, eh, it's too early to do a rerun. <laughs> it was only seven months ago. But I also realized that some of you weren't here last May, and you've joined our church family since then. So I'm going to share a few of the key points from that message, and then focus on one particular area, of the Spirit's work in our lives, and the area through which he wants to work um, in us and through us to make a difference in the world. First of all, it's important to understand that the Holy Spirit is God. He is the third person of the Trinity. He is as much God as this Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is not some force that emanates from God. The Holy Spirit is divine, defined throughout Scripture as having attributes that only God can have. The Holy Spirit is God. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is a person, a spirit, but he has, he has personality. In the passage we read in John 16, Jesus repeatedly refers to the Holy Spirit in personal terms. He will guide you into all truth. He will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me. He doesn't refer to the Holy Spirit as it. There are many in the world today who believe that they can somehow harness the power of supernatural force or energy that is all around us. I was listening on CBC Radio this week, to, and somebody was on there who, who practices Reiki, and using the language of, you know, tapping into our energy in order to bring about change. And sometimes we as believers, we get caught up in that kind of thinking, in that kind of language. 
But the Holy Spirit is not karma, not some kind of vague, nebulous energy that we somehow try and tap into. The Holy Spirit is not some vague, impersonal force. The Holy Spirit is a person with whom we could enter into a relationship, just like God and Jesus. Third, the Holy Spirit is near. Christ was able to be physically near, you know, a few hundred, maybe a few thousand people and could impact their lives directly when he walked on earth. And yet he knew the importance of fulfilling his mission and returning to the Father, for if he didn't, then the Holy Spirit couldn't come. So he describes his going and the Spirit's coming as being for our good. The Spirit brings the work of Christ near to us, near to each and every one of us. The Spirit desires to be personally and actively involved in each and every one of our lives. Now, the Spirit's first and most important job is to shine the light, shine a flashlight, so to speak, on Jesus. John 16, 14 says, He will bring glory to me, Jesus speaking, by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. The Holy Spirit's job is not to draw attention to himself. His job is to build the kingdom of God, and that is accomplished by pointing the way to Jesus the way, the truth, and the life, through whom everyone must come in order to reach the Father. The theologian Henry writes, the sum total of the Spirit's work is to hold the spotlight on Jesus Christ. That is the Holy Spirit's primary job, to point humanity, to point all of us to Jesus so that we might believe and be saved. Another of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to bring conviction of sin and to spur people on to righteous living. What the world often calls our conscience, Jiminy Cricket in Pinocchio, is really the Holy Spirit in action. When we feel that nagging sense of the fact that what we're doing is just not right, or just that, that's not just some internal morality meter kicking in and going into gear in our brains, that's God. That's God, the Holy Spirit becoming actively involved in our lives and urging us, even pleading with us to turn away from wrong, turn away from wrong and live in righteousness the way that God has always planned for us to live. To put a practical spin on this, perhaps if we stop thinking of it as, you know, that little voice inside my head and began understanding that that's the Spirit of God speaking to us when we're tempted to sin, then maybe we'd be a little more apt to listen and to obey. The Holy Spirit has a role in regeneration, in in making us new creatures in Christ. The Spirit is actively involved when we become Christians. He is actively involved in the change from darkness to light that takes place in our lives. He has a role in reestablishing our relationship with God the Father and in transforming us. He is involved in salvation. The Holy Spirit brings conviction to our hearts, which, which leads to repentance leads to us for being sorry for the things we've done and and doing a 180, turning from this way of living to God's way of living. And when we do this, the Spirit, because of the forgiveness of sins provided by Christ's death on the cross, brings regeneration, makes, makes us new on the inside. He moves in. He changes our standing before God from sinner to forgiven. And he breathes new life in us. Now, a role of the Holy Spirit, which I think is a little hard for some people to wrap their minds around, is that the Holy Spirit indwells us. The Holy Spirit lives within us. In John 14, 17, Jesus described the Holy Spirit as someone who will be with his followers and who will be in them. In both 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 6, 19, we are described as the temple of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit lives within believers. And this indwelling takes place at conversion, when we are saved, when we respond to the Spirit's conviction with repentance and commitment to follow Christ, the Holy Spirit takes up residency inside of us. And we've, in a sense, handed him the keys to our heart, to our soul, to our spirit. And he makes himself at home. And he begins the work of changing us from the inside out into the person that he created us to be. Through salvation and indwelling, the Spirit begins the work of producing Christ-likeness in the believer. And the Spirit accomplishes this by by teaching and by illuminating or shining light on 
teaching in our lives. 1 Corinthians 2.12 says, We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand freely what God has given us. I don't think the spirit's role is to, to reveal stuff. Sometimes you might see that where, in the sense, the Holy Spirit is, is teaching you something brand new that no one else in the entire world has ever heard before or that the spirit has never said to anybody before. It's not so much revelation as it is illumination, taking something from scripture, taking something that, that the church has always taught and just shining a light on it so it's kind of like, whoa, I never saw it that way before. And you can begin to understand what it is that God is trying to teach us, primarily through the scriptures. John 15, 26 says, When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth that goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. The spirit within us will help clarify the teachings of Christ and, and shine the spotlight on Christ and, and increase our understanding. John 14, 26 says, But the spirit... But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. He will not only teach us, but he will remind us. And I think that is one of the neatest practical ministries of the Holy Spirit, to, to bring up to our memory at the exact time we need it, the exact scripture verse that we need to hear. That's why it's so cool when we sing songs that have scripture in it, because music tends to embed things in our memory. And so many times when you need to hear something from God, all of a sudden the song will just pop into your head. And that's the Spirit speaking to you and reminding you about what you need to hear in that situation. John 16, 13 says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. How reassuring it is in an age when truth is increasingly relative that, that God has given us his Holy Spirit to indwell us and to be able to sort through the truth from the lies, and to be able to guide us into all of God's truth. And the goal of all this teaching that this, and reminding that the Spirit does in our lives is to sanctify us, to, to transform us into the image of Christ. The whole point of the Spirit's work in our lives is to shine the, the light on Christ, that, be it through conviction before we're saved, or through the work of sanctification, which also involved being convicted sometimes after salvation, but, you know, teaching us and prodding us and, and leading us on and guiding us so that the image of Christ can be reflected in us more and more every day. Second Corinthians three seventeen to 18 says, Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord, who is spirit. The first youth group I ever did at Calvary Church in Port Hope, that was one of our theme verses, and the name of our youth group was the cry, C-R-I, which stood for Christ's reflected image, because the whole point of the Spirit's work in our lives and the whole point of why God has saved us and wants us to grow is so that we would, be, we would reflect the image of Christ, that we would become more and more like the character and image of Jesus every day. That's the Spirit's job, to daily transform us into the likeness of Christ. But he can't do that without our co cooperation. We have to work with him. We need to place ourselves under his control so that he can work in us. Being led by the Spirit, being controlled by the Spirit, being transformed by the Spirit results in fruit, the Bible says, which Andrew read for us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Possessing these qualities in ever-increasing measure will make us more and more into the image of Christ. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Paul calls these godly characteristics the fruit of the Spirit. A few years ago, I went to a seminar that was put on by the school board. I think it was on um, restorative justice. I think that's what I went to. And it was held at the Salvation Army Church in Coburg. And we were in a Sunday school class that had obviously been used for lessons on the fruit of the Spirit. And there were cutouts of the wall of grapes and oranges, and grapes with the word faithfulness on it, and oranges with the word self-control on it, and, and so on and so on. And someone asked, what's with the fruit? Why are the fruits on the wall? And I said, well, I think it's because these characteristics... Our, these things are characteristics that God wants to grow in our lives, like fruit grows on a vine or a tree. 
And they're like, oh, never thought of it before. That makes sense. Jesus said that he is the vine and we are the branches. And as we stay connected to the vine, as we stay connected to Jesus, as we live in the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit will grow in our lives. And as the fruit of the Spirit grows in our lives, God will work through us to make a difference in the world around us. Sometimes you may hear the, con- the, the phrase spiritual warfare, and sometimes it can be a hard thing to wrap our head around. One of the best definitions I ever heard of spiritual warfare, of fighting Satan, of fighting the work of the enemy in this world, to go into a situation where the enemy has a foothold, where certain attitudes and certain behaviors and certain activities that are not from God are dominant, to go into those situations and do the exact opposite. And an important way of doing this is to pelt the enemy with fruit, to lob fruit at the enemy. And we wouldn't normally view fruit as a weapon of warfare. Usually we see someone pelted with fruit at a protest rally, or back in the old days in vaudeville. You ever see those old movies where there's an act on stage and it's terrible, and just the fruit and tomatoes and the stuff starts getting chucked at them. But I believe God is calling us to allow the fruit of the Spirit to grow in our lives so that we can use it as weapons against the work of the enemy and help people who are far from God to see that there's a different way to live. There's a better way to live their lives. God wants to build the fruit of the Spirit in us so that we can make a difference. Now, our job is not to to cause fruit to grow. Fruit doesn't just sit there and kind of go, i got to grow, i got to grow, or, or fruit lying on the ground after it's fallen from the tree will not continue to grow. It will ripen a bit maybe, and then it'll start to rot. Fruit can only grow when it's connected to the vine. And our job is just to stay connected to the vine, to stay connected to Jesus and to allow God to give us all we need for the fruit, for the godly character to grow in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit is love. The word here used here in the Greek is agape. It's a selfless, sacrificial, unconditional love. It's the love that Jesus shows for us. It's not generated based on our natural affections towards somebody or, or how we connect with somebody because we have so much in common. Rather, agape love is an exercise of the will. It's a deliberate choice. It's a deliberate choice to seek someone else's welfare over and above your own. One commentator writes that agape love puts the beloved first and it sacrifices pride and self-interest and even possessions for the sake of the beloved. Many people in the world today have a twisted view of what love is. Some equate it with sex. Others look for love as something that will fulfill their needs and their desires. Others still feel that love is is an outgrowth of feelings, and and when the feelings dissipate, well, so does the love. They don't realize that love is a verb. Love is something you do. Love is a choice. In a world that doesn't really understand the fullness of the love God wants us to know, let us allow God to grow in us the fruit of love, and by sharing that fruit, make a difference in this world. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. Joy is distinct from happiness. Happiness is derived by what happens to us on the outside. Our happiness is affected by our life circumstances and by the things that happen to us. Joy comes from the inside. It's a true contentment. It's a delight that comes from what's internal rather than what's external. Ultimately, joy is derived from from our faith in God, in the delight that we find in his grace and in his character and his care for us and his deliverance from fear and sin. Many people in the world today rarely experience joy. We all know people who rarely smile. Many have experienced terrible things in their lives that have made them bitter and unhappy. And there are others whose souls desperately want joy, but instead of looking for joy, they look for happiness, and they search for it in all the wrong places. And they soon discover just how temporary happiness can be, and they're disillusioned. In a world that confuses joy with happiness that has experienced so much hurt that it has become bitter, let us allow God to grow in us the fruit of joy and by sharing that fruit, making a difference in this world. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. 
This gives the idea of wholeness, where all the parts fit together. And when everything in life is fraying at the edges and falling apart, peace can sometimes be really hard to find. But when everything comes together nicely, you can sit at home at the end of the day and just feel, ah, a state of peace. But honestly, that rarely happens. And we need to find our peace, not in the circumstances around us, but in the knowledge that God's in control. That no matter what's happening, God is king. God is sovereign. And he is fitting all the pieces of our lives together, even those pieces that may seem out of control. He's fitting them together for our good and for his glory. And knowing that, we can rest in safety and security. Knowing that, we can know peace. And peace gives the idea of harmony. The, the peace between individuals can be found as we submit our wants and submit our desires to God and submit them to what he wants for us instead. Instead of discord amongst people, we find concord. And as the pieces of his church fit together in unity, wholeness is found and his work can be accomplished. Many people in the world today experience anxiety instead of peace. The epidemic of anxiety among young people stems from a lack of safety and a lack of security. In a world where 40% of youth and young adults experience divorce and many others experience dysfunction and never-ending conflict at home, where they face drama and pressure to succeed at school and at work, it's no wonder there seems to be little room to find peace. Even in the church, personal agendas can dominate and a place that's supposed to provide peace can become a place of conflict. In a world where true inner peace and even peace among individuals is so hard to find, let us allow God to grow in us the fruit of peace and by sharing that fruit, make a difference in this world. The fruit of the of Spirit is patience. We don't have a word exactly for it in English, but the idea expressed here is to be long-tempered, you know, as, as, as opposed to short-tempered. That a long time would have to pass before someone or something would provoke us to blow our stack, you know, and lose our temper. We do not respond quickly with anger, but rather demonstrate long-suffering. We exercise restraint, not flying off the handle, but, but waiting before addressing a wrong. It's a patience that shows itself in perseverance, in endurance, in bearing with one another, in being patient with one another, self-restraint. Many people in today's world are impacted by a hair-trigger temper, whether it's their own temper or that of a co-worker or a schoolmate or a spouse. It's so easy to snap on people and, you know, and to let out our negative feelings and emotions without any thought for how it makes the other person feel. Rather than wait and respond after a while with patience or even not respond at all, the world is so quick to type out their anger and press the send button without really considering the consequences of what we're saying to the other person. In a short-tempered world where anger is allowed to be vented without control, let us allow God to grow in us the fruit of patience and by sharing that fruit, make a difference in this world. The fruit of the Spirit is kindness. The word used here literally means to be useful and profitable. When we are kind, we show ourselves to be useful in meeting the real needs of other people. Not only, not, the, not just the people we like or the needs of the people we're friends with, but, but even meeting the needs of those who may tax our patience, even meeting the needs of those who we disagree with. Kindness wants the best for others, and it'll do whatever can be done to meet the needs of another and help lift them up. Many in the world today are prim focused primarily on themselves. And when something is made available that is useful or profitable, the first inclination is to spend it on themselves rather than give it away to the benefit of others. In an increasing polarized society, the thought of doing something kind to someone that we actually disagree with is becoming something that's just a, fair, a foreign thought. In a world, world where a kind action or a kind word can be hard to find. Let us allow God to grow in us the fruit of kindness, and by sharing that fruit, make a difference in this world. The fruit of the Spirit is goodness. Goodness and kindness are very closely related in that the focus is on the deeds that will have a good effect on other people. 
But goodness has an aspect of, of holiness to it. It is acting selflessly on behalf of another. But, but that action can be something that the other person might not necessarily see as helpful at that time. Tough love can be an act of goodness. Confronting sin in another person's life lovingly can be an act of goodness. Helping people recognize the, the idols in their lives, the things that they put up on a pedestal above their worship of God and, or things that they are striving for that really aren't worth it. Pointing those out and coming alongside them and helping them get rid of those things, that can be an act of goodness. For many in today's world, being treated with tough love or being confronted for their own good can be seen as offensive and intolerant rather than an act of love and goodness. Every human being, each one of us here, was made to worship something. But so many are more apt to worship created things rather than the creator. They would not see being challenged on that as an act of goodness. In a world where there is idolatry, where so many people are heading down a path that will lead them away from the purpose that God created them for, let us allow God to, to grow in us the fruit of goodness. And by sharing that fruit, make a difference in this world. The fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. When faithfulness is present in our lives, we become known as someone who can be relied on. I've been, watch, I've been binge watching the Waltons back from the 1970s, and I just watched an episode called The Big Brother, and it was all about John Boy and how everybody was relying on him, and he was starting to crack under the pressure. But, but he had developed a character where he was faithful, and he could be known as someone that, he could, be, that could be relied on. When faithfulness builds in us, we can be relied on. We can be trusted. We become known as someone can, who can, that can place their confidence in us, as someone who will keep their promises. Now, being that kind of person isn't always convenient. It can get in the way of what we want to do. But it's something that God wants to develop in us because it's something that the world desperately needs. Many people today will make promises that they are either unable to keep or even have no intention of keeping. So many are longing for good, close friends, and yet they realize that trust being an essential part of friendship and trust being so hard to find, they have a hard time finding a true friend. In a world where a faithful friend can be hard to find, let us allow God to grow in us the fruit of faithfulness. And by sharing that fruit, make a difference in this world. The fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. Some older translations use the word meekness, which is a word that's gotten kind of a bad rap over the years. Many people equate meekness with weakness, but the context here does no such thing. The idea of the word translated gentleness is power under control. It's gentle strength. It's power coupled with humility. The person, person exercising this gentleness would have the power and authority to act harshly if they wanted to, but instead they use the, their power to help and bring calm. One commentator compared this gentleness to the kind of person you would want to have help you if you were injured. Say you were on a, a hike in the woods like Ruth's video showed and you fell and you sprained your ankle. You would want someone strong enough to be able to carry you to safety and yet gentle enough so that they wouldn't injure you further. Gentleness in this context also speaks of someone with a mild disposition, someone who would respond to anger with a humility and a kindness that would, would calm the angry person down. It would be the embodiment of that verse that says a gentle answer turns away wrath. We would have the power and authority to crush that angry person if we wanted to, but instead, in gentleness, we bring calm. The world today can be a very harsh place. Strength is often not used to help others, but rather to hurt, even destroy others. The weak can often be left behind without help or without support, even in the church. Anger is responded to with more anger, and what was once a small disagreement escalates into a full-blown battle. I was sharing with the youth a couple of Wednesdays ago that I remember I was at Dr. Hawkins one day, and I, the principal there I got to know very well, and, and I watched him interact with a young person, and he, 
he came up very calmly to the young person and said, and gave them some instruction, you really need to not do this or whatever, very calmly. And the the kid just snapped back at him. And then he kind of went, okay, and he responded stronger. And the kid responded stronger. And it went back and forth two or three times. Then finally the principal said, office. And I was sitting there going, going, kind of going, that was, that was nothing. It started off as absolutely nothing, but because it escalated, because of the lack of, of gentleness, because of the anger be given, being vented, it became something that it didn't have to be. In a world that can be harsh, where the weak are ignored and strength is used to bully rather than to help, let us allow God to grow in us the fruit of gentleness and by sharing that fruit, make a difference in this world. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Self-control exhibits restraint. But it's more than, than just, you know, self-restraint through willpower. It's a restraint, a mastery of our actions that comes from within, from the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Older versions of the Bible use the word temperance, where one commentator defines as the, the virtue of one who masters his desires and appetites, especially his sensual appetites. Sin no longer masters us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we exercise self-control, and through it, we master the sinful nature. Many in today's world are guided by their appetites and desires. When I was in high school, you'd hear the expression, if it feels good, do it. And it became popular then, and it's become a mantra through generations to today. Delayed gratification is not a desired goal for those who want it all, and they want it now. In a world where people want to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season without thought to the long-term consequences, let us allow God to grow in us the fruit of self-control and by sharing that fruit, make a difference in this world. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Nine fruit of the Spirit that God wants to grow in us and ripen in us so that they become a part of our very character. And as they do, we are made more and more into the image and likeness of Christ, which is the ultimate goal of every Christian, and it's the ultimate purpose of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. God does not desire to build these characteristics in us solely for our own benefit. By his Holy Spirit, he dwells in us and desires to work through us to show himself to everybody else that he's created and to show them that he can do the same work in them that he's doing in us, to show them that he has created them for something more than the life they're experiencing, to show them that they were created for a purpose, for God's good purposes. Years ago, I filled out a survey, and one of the questions was, list five things you cannot, you can, you cannot do without in your life. And I came up with four pretty easily, but I was stuck on the fifth until one thought came to my mind and I wrote down, making a difference. And deep inside, I think that's something that each one of us really wants to do with our lives. We want to make a difference. And we can do that by trying to do good things in our own strength, yes. Or we can allow God's Holy Spirit to work in us. And through our lives, we can open our lives to him and allow the spirit to grow fruit in our lives. Fruit that will make us into the image of Christ. Fruit that is meant to be shared. Fruit that will bring nourishment to places where people are starving spiritually. Fruit of the spirit that will make a difference. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, I thank you that um, once we turned our lives over to you and we've become Christians, and you thank you, Lord, that you indwell us by your Spirit, that we're not alone in this. You don't just leave us to, to figure it out for ourselves. You give us your word, and you give us the Holy Spirit to guide us and to lead us and to build your fruit in us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would build these characteristics in our lives, that you would make us more and more like Christ, and that you would help us to share that fruit with others so that we can make a difference in this world for your honor and for your glory. Lord, this world can be a very difficult place, and we need you. We need your Holy Spirit to guide us. So we pray, come, Holy Spirit. Come and make us new. Come and change us. Come and make us more like you. Come and build the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. 
so that we can truly make a difference for Jesus in the lives of the people around us. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the honor to be part of the changes that you want to make in this world. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.